St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister puts the ball in the opposition's court on acceding to the CCJ as the country's final court. That's our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Tuesday, July 24. From the CMC News Centre in Bridgetown, I'm Nicole Best. Good evening. Vincentian Prime Minister Dr. Ralf Gonzalez says the time is now for the island to accede to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Just days after he threw out a challenge to the opposition New Democratic NDP to support the move to replace Britain's Privy Council with the Trinidad-based CCJ, Dr. Gonzalez told a press conference on Monday that having a Vincentian at the helm of the court should make it easier for his own countrymen to support the Caribbean Court. You're asking why now? Well, the impetus obviously comes. I don't have to read and spell. Because we have a Vincentian who is now the president of the court. It, 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 it gives a greater possibility, a greater likelihood that person may say, well, I know this man, you know, he's saying whatever misgivings I had and we will go. The move to the CCJ was among changes to the Constitution that citizens rejected in a November 2009 referendum. But Gonzales pointed out last Friday that all that is really needed is a two-thirds majority support in Parliament on the constitutional change. And with his Unity Labour Party having only eight of the 15 seats in Parliament, he said he would need the opposition's support to pass a constitutional amendment to sign on to the CCJ's appellate jurisdiction. On Monday, Gonzales doubled down on his call for that support and went further by putting the ball fully in the opposition's court. He told local media if the opposition moves a motion to accede to the CCJ, he will support it. Say, I'm opposition, but in this thing, Ralph has pussyfooted, he has done all these things. We are going to be the government on this thing. Work with the public service attorney general. Work with them. Work with the public service attorney do a bill. Do it. You introduce it. You second it. You go down in history for introducing it when Ralph couldn't bring it about. You second it when I couldn't do it. I, I don't even want to second it. But I will tell you, introduce it and I will vote for it. The Caribbean has been urged to brace for floods over the next three months. The warning comes from the Barbados-based Caribbean Institute for Metrology and Hydrology, the CIMH, which says there's a potential for flooding and flash floods, even as rainfall is forecast to be either at usual or lower levels for the peak of the wet season, with fewer wet days than usual. In its latest outlook for the August to October period, the CIMH's Caribbean Regional Climate Outlook Forum noted that with cooler ocean temperatures than in recent years, the warmest part of the year is not forecast to be excessively hot and the number of heat waves should remain low. It added that some short dry spells are likely in most areas except for Belize and the Lesser Antilles and there is potential for flooding and flash floods across the region. In Antigua and Barbuda, the Tobacco Control Bill, which prohibits smoking in public, was passed after debate in the lower house on Monday. Health Minister Malvin Joseph said the legislation seeks to eliminate the damage of second-hand smoke and that the government has an obligation to protect those who are innocent bystanders. The bill places several restrictions on smokers and people involved in the tobacco business. We get more in this ABS News report. While there is widespread support for the intentions of the bill, not everyone agreed with the specifics of the legislation, which saw several amendments in the committee stage. One contention had to do with how far away from windows, doors, and waiting areas a smoker must be when lighting up on the outdoors. Secondhand smoke can impact depends on the, what, the number of people and the number of people smoking. It's not because it has to have to be indoors. But you, I have the science from the American Health Organization the World Health Organization have published these facts. You're telling someone who is, who is at, at a function that they have to walk 100 feet from their family to smoke a cigarette. I am saying to you, I just find that 100 feet may be a bit excessive, bearing in mind is outside of the building. I, I do think that the 30 meters might be a little excessive. And let us try and come to a common ground. Let us say 15 meters or, or something to that extent. Um, I agree that there ought to be some, some, some amendment to that. 
30 meters, I think, is way too excessive. Mr. Chairman, with respect, it would appear to me, sir, that the majority view seems to be that the 30 meters is a bit far. Yeah, strike a compromise, please. So 15 meters, it appears to be that is what most of the com my colleagues are in agreement with. Minister Joseph believes his colleagues' tendency to scrutinize each other's actions demonstrates the inherent checks and balances at every level of the ABLP administration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that the bill shortly entitled the Tobacco Control Bill 2080 has passed through the committee stage with sundry amendments. And may I say, Mr. Speaker, that you really don't need an opposition on the other side of this bill. <laughs> I've been in this house for quite a while, and I've never seen such spirited, uh, what you call, uh, scrutiny of a, of a bill on the same side. Jamaicans traveling to M Namibia for business or tourism won't be needing visas anymore. And that's because the two governments on Monday agreed to a visa waiver program. The agreement was the first of several between the two countries as Jamaica's Prime Minister Andrew Holness held discussions with the Namibian president. We get more from TVJ News. Two leaders, Prime Minister Andrew Holness and Dr. Hage Gengob, President of the Republic of Namibia, meeting for the first time on Monday. Mr. Holness is the first Jamaican Prime Minister to set foot in Namibia. I'm very honored to have received my brother, and he declared me as his new friend. I also declare now that he's my new friend. The two leaders were locked in bilateral meetings to strengthen the relationship between both countries. First, the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding to establish political consultation between foreign ministries and another in sports. In fact, the two countries have been most involved when it comes to sports. Jamaica has been the training ground for Namibian student athletes who were preparing for the 2016 Olympics. Our countries share similar development aspirations, which are reflected in our respective 2030 National Development Plan, Vision 2030, with particular focus on capacity building for national development. What better way to achieve this objective than through education and training, which is a significant priority for Jamaica, as I understand it is for Namibia. Then another piece of good news. The Namibian government has granted a visa waiver to Jamaicans seeking to visit. Other deals on the table include urban development, trade, and investment. Prime Minister was telling me privately, Namibians must come to Jamaica and invest I'm reporting to you that's what he said. So please, business people, you are invited. And on your behalf, I must also invite Jamaicans to come here. Still in Jamaica, international ratings agency Moody's has shifted the country's outlook from stable to positive, but has maintained its B3 rating. It says it expects improved economic growth in the coming years, with GDP increasing to an average of 2% annually, as Jamaica benefits from expansion of the tourism sector and a pickup in construction activities. We get more in this report. The rating agency issued this statement on Friday while maintaining Jamaica's B3 long-term issuer ratings. According to Moody's, the key drivers for the positive outlook were ongoing fiscal consolidation and improvement of institutional capacity and policy effectiveness. In the release, Moody's says it believes Jamaica is likely to run sizable primary surpluses of about 7% of GDP and report broadly balanced fiscal accounts. Moody's also foresees the government's debts falling around 100% of GDP this fiscal year and anticipates further decline in subsequent years. It commends the Jamaican authorities for showing a strong commitment to fiscal consolidation. And still to come in Caribbean Newsland, Trinidad and Tobago's National Security Minister explains how change in mindsets can help the Twin Island Republic's crime fight. Stay with us. There's more news after the break. Her passion for what she believes is unmatched. So you could, I wanted to get to the point where you can shake me off that perfect piece. He's a book off radio host, philanthropist, and motivational speaker. And I said, I'm going to write you a check for 10000 which I'm not. <laughs> Spirit, soul, and body. 
I'm Karita D, and you're listening to Girlfriend Get a Life. Trinidad and Tobago's Minister of National Security, Edmund Dillon, says the National Crime Prevention Program, which he announced last week, is seeking to change the approach to crime in the country. Speaking on Good Morning Trinidad and Tobago on Monday, he said the program focuses on prevention by trying to eliminate the mindsets that lead to criminality, as we hear in this C News report. I said the, the, the program is about prevention of crime because right now, we are reactive. We are very reactive in the society. We deal with, with issues where the minds of the individual have already been developed in terms of committing crimes and so on. So law enforcement reacts. Uh, the, 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 the agency of national security reacts. Let us look at a proactive approach. Let us try to deal with the factory that's creating these mindsets. The minister said while prevention is crucial, there will be investment in manpower and technology to aid in the fight against crime. Bulk of the efforts of law enforcers must be deterrent. Preventing, again, is another preventative matter. How do you prevent crime from occurring? And it's one of the areas is by your presence. Mm -hmm. By your presence and by your quick response to an incident as it happens because you're on spot. But you also have to use technology, and that's why things like the CCTV system comes about and modern technology, communications, and so on, so that you can respond. That's a deterrent. Officials in the Dominican Republic say nearly 70,000 Haitians have been deported during the first six months of this year as measures to control the illegal entry of Haitians into the Spanish-speaking country are intensified. The Directorate of Dominican Migration, the DGM, said for the first three months of the year, nearly 35,000 Haitians were deported during migration controls or expelled to the border. In May, nearly 11,000 Haitians were sent back home, and in April, nearly 11,500 were deported. Then last month, almost 12,000 Haitians were deported, and 7,000 others were turned back at the border trying to enter illegally. Some of those deported had been living for more than a decade on the island that the two countries share. A national plan for the regulation of abroad and the extension of temporary residence cards granted to Haitians will expire on August 26th this year, and most of the 239,000 Haitians who have not been able to regularize their status will be under threat of deportation. The DGM says it's urgent that Haitian authorities enter into discussions with the Dominican Republic to avoid a possible massive repatriation in the coming months. Guyana's Foreign Affairs Minister Carl Greenwich says immigrants entering the country through legal ports will not be criminalized. During a press conference on Monday, he made special mention of the influx of Venezuelans into the country and said government is making every effort to avoid deportation. We get more in this Capital News report. The harsh treatment of some migrants has been brought to the fore, and according to Minister of Foreign Affairs Carl Greenwich, concerns were raised regarding the need to avoid criminalizing such persons. For what might be regarded as simple um, immigration infractions, and so that was, that was a major consideration. Essentially, some common guidelines were put together. One, you don't want to be providing um, arrangements that allow undesirables, undesirables from the point of view of criminals, for example, terrorists and others, into the territory. Um, so that is a first consideration. As regards others, the issue is to respect 
the Treaty of Chagaramas. Minister Greenwich said what Guyana has done is to ensure that those who seek entry establish where they are coming from, among other things. And that they don't fall into a category that we would regard as problematic. And they are required to enter Guyana by its lawful entry points. So if you use a port of entry, if you, if you use some point other than a lawful port of entry, the authorities will have to say something, something to say about it. You will be required to uh, satisfy that requirement before consideration will be given to you being uh, entitled to stay for any period. And I would treat that as a separate issue from the question of Guyanese. Those Guyanese who are returning from Venezuela will have to establish that they are Guyanese by birth, naturalization, or descent. If it can be established that you're Guyanese, Guyana government has nothing to say about where you can go. You are entitled to go anywhere in Guyana. The point also that uh, needs to be borne in mind, specifically in relation to Whitewater, is that there are health requirements. And whether you're Guyanese or not, when you enter the territory from an area that has been subject to, uh, if not a pandemic, then illnesses, uh, malaria, measles, you know, some of these have severe implications for indigenous people then you are required to ensure that you get vaccinated and inoculated. That applies to everyone, irrespective of their nationality. With regards to Venezuelans, the Foreign Affairs Minister said they are required to enter at an official point and can request to stay. The region as a whole, he added, is encouraging countries not to deport or jail Venezuelans for immigration infractions in light of what is taking place in that country. And ahead in Newsline Sport, the Wendy's captain expects big things from young batting star Shimron Admire. Stay with us. Sport is next. This hurricane tip comes to you, compliments the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency and the Caribbean Media Corporation. Be prepared. Make sure you listen for official information to ensure that the all clear announcement has been given. Join leading media and communications executives as well as climate change experts in Kingston, Jamaica from August 13 to 15 for the Caribbean Broadcasting Union 49th Annual General Assembly. This year's assembly, held in partnership with the CARICOM Climate Change Center, explores the theme, Building Resilience to Climate Change, Business, Technology and Content Options for Caribbean Media. Featured presenters include the Honorable Dr. Rua Reed, Jamaica's Minister Responsible for Information, the region's Chief Climate Change Negotiator, Mr. Carlos Fuller, the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, the Broadcasting Commission of Jamaica and the International Telecommunications Union Caribbean Office. And broadcast manufacturers and media services enjoy special exhibition rates at this year's conference, joining premier exhibitor Utilsat. For more information on discounted rates for delegates staying at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel or flying on the official airline, Caribbean Airlines, go to the CBU website or call the Secretariat. The CBU looks forward to welcoming you to this key conference on climate change and the Caribbean media. West Indies captain Jason Holder has backed young batting star Shipran Hetmeyer to start notching big scores soon and has encouraged him to spend more time at the crease in order to achieve this. The 21-year-old top scored with 52 in Sunday's first one day international against Bangladesh as West Indies failed to overhaul 279 and plunged to a 48-run defeat at the National Stadium at Providence. 
Yeah, it's something that him and I have been talking about for a little while. You know, he's been probably one of the better, he's probably one of the better players to spin in our, in our dressing room, and he's also one of the few left handers that we have in the middle order. You know, I just encourage him, you know, to go deep. You know, I spoke to him last night before the game, and you know, one of the things we spoke about is him behind out to at least the 35th over before he starts to go and st uh, starts to expand. You know, probably the situation in the game today maybe had dictated him to go a little deeper than the 35th, down to probably the 40th over, and then giving you know the, the hitters at the end enough leeway to come in and next execute their game, you know, but it's something we just spoke about as well, you know, but he's a young, talented player. I think he will learn as time goes on and we, we just got to, you know, invest some time in it. West Indies were looking dangerous when Hitmeyer was involved in a 40-run third wicket stand with superstar opener Chris Gale, who made 40 from 60 balls with a four and a pair of sixes. But in the 22nd over, Hitmeyer turned down a quick single to shot third man, but Gale passed the point of no return, leaving the Windies' most experienced batsman stranded. And while Gale was not his usual explosive self, Holder said there was no cause for concern. I think everybody expects Gale to be his normal dominant self, you know. We just want him to impose himself on the, on the power play. He's been one to do that. Maybe the, the, the surfaces are worn, and you could probably blast through the power play as such. But, you know, again, he adjusted his game quite well and, and picked up a few singles for us up front. You know, he obviously got his odd boundary here and there, and I felt he was looking, you know, pretty good. That's unfortunate with the run out. Um, just obviously we just need to tighten up on that area as well. Meanwhile, former South Africa Test captain Neil McKenzie was scheduled to link up with Bangladesh on Tuesday after he was appointed batting consultant to the touring side for the ongoing white ball series against West Indies. In a statement, the Bangladesh Cricket Board said McKenzie would work with the team until next year's Cricket World Cup in England and Wales. There will be little time for McKenzie to settle in as Bangladesh clashed with the Windies in the second one day international at the National Stadium at Providence on Wednesday. McKenzie fills the void left by former Sri Lankan batsman Philan Samarwira, who was axed following last year's ICC Champions Trophy in England. High performance coach Simon Helmut served as batting coach on recent tours. Bangladesh played their final ODI against the Windies on Saturday at Warner Park in St. Kitts before turning their attention to a three-match T20 international series beginning next Tuesday at the same venue and ending with a double header at the Central Broward Regional Park in Fort Lauderdale on August 4th and 5th. The Jamaica Hockey Federation has moved to strengthen its national teams through the signing of an agreement with the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. TVJ's Simon Preston has more. The national men's, women's and youth hockey teams will receive strength and conditioning treatment up to the end of 2019 under the recently signed agreement between the Jamaica Hockey Federation, the JHF, and the University of the West Indies' Mona Academy of Sport. Dean of the Faculty of Sports at UWE, Dr. Akshay Man Singh, says the program will aid in extending the careers of hockey players. First thing is injury prevention. That directly relates to longevity of an athlete. In fact, what's known, and this is beyond hockey, that if you can prevent that first injury, because the biggest predictor of a second injury is a first injury. In other words, if you get injured, chances are you're going to get re-injured. And that's what affects the longevity of an athlete. So the aim is to prevent injuries, but then after that, to pick up deficiencies. So you'll have a set of people some will be stronger in power, others will be stronger in, in endurance, others will have explosive power. How do you improve on the individual aspects? And, and that's the sort of thing which I think you're going to see a change amongst the hockey players. You're going to see a change in, in performance and longevity through those, those means. President of the JHF, Fabian Stewart, expressed contentment with this partnership. No, I'm very pleased with the partnership. Uh, the agreement speaks to the development of uh, sports science uh, speaks to the development of our national teams utilizing sports science. Uh, it is the absolute way in which um, the world is going in terms of the preparation of teams. So I'm actually very pleased with it. Stewart believes the deal should help improve the performance of national teams in the near future. It is a part of the building block. It's a process. As I came in and I explained, you know, we have to have a little bit of patience in terms of getting our teams to elite level, but it is certainly uh, a, a very important step along the way. Head coach Nicholas Brown speaks about the progress his players has made since the agreement was made. I've seen great improvement with what has taken place, the recovery aspect, the strengthening and the conditioning. So moving forward for my sporting body as well as all, it will be a good step going forward. 
And finally, in horse racing, Jamaican Sean Bridgman dominated the nine race card at Ellis Park on Sunday, winning the feature fifty thousand US dollar Good Lord Stakes aboard favorite Majestic Affair in a handsome triple at the Southern United States Oval. The thirty-nine year old produced a stalking ride aboard the six year old gelding before getting the better of the six horse field in the stretch and storming to the finish one and a quarter lengths clear in a time of one minute fifteen point four one seconds. Ellis Park track announcer Jimmy McCurney has the call. Off in majestic affair with a fleeting beginning. Concord Fast is away in good order, and now Smart Street will prompt the base from the inside. Shut the box off the gate, racing in fourth. To that one's outside control, stake is a close up fifth, and four links for the back to He Money, who's last of them all. Up the back side they go. They have just outside five and a half furlongs to travel, and all of a sudden Smart Spree clears off. Smart Spree controlling the tempo here in the good lord shows the way by just about a length and a half. As Majestic Affairs splitting horses in a joint second, covered up by Control Stake, who is third. Now shut the box, rods a rail from fourth, Concord fast in a good stalking position outside of that one in fifth, only about three and a half off the lead, and then six or seven back to He's Money, who's out at the back, 22 and two fifth seconds of time for Smart Spree's opening quarter. Now Control Stake, the son of Discreetly Mind, breezes up to the outside, three parts of length for the back in second. Now Majestic Affair being called upon by Bridgeman, angles outside of Control Stake, and now Concord fast is going to duck in behind him. Meanwhile, shut the boxes in with a chance, half mile, 45 and one, and they turn on down in the good Lord, and Smart Spree shaking up. Up, nut shifting lanes there. Shut the box, had to angle towards a fence, and Majestic Affair is coming at him on the stand side. One sixteenth left in the good Lord. Majestic Affair is there from Shut the Box. Majestic of Affair is going to win it here. Majestic Affair wins by just about a length. Shut the Box was second, tight for third between Control Stake and Smart Spree. They were third and fourth, but the running time, one fifteen and two. Majestic Affair takes the 41st edition of the good Lord. And that's the sport. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Summer and fall, Brilliant Barbados is offering you hotel discounts of up to 40% off regular rates. When you book through Expedia before October 31st, 2018, discover our Dine Around program specials at participating restaurants across the island, starting from U.S. $50 per person on three-course meals. For further information and full details to book your Barbados holiday, visit BrilliantBarbados.com. When you buy a ticket on LIAT, outside of the taxes paid, you're getting more than just a flight. You're getting well-trained, qualified, competent crew. The newest, fuel-efficient, environmentally friendly aircraft. The best aircraft maintenance process and people to get you there safely. More destinations and connections with partners than any airline in the region. All so that we can connect you to special moments with friends and family, festivals and fun. We connect you to your business associates, which helps you and the region's economies to grow. So there is more to the fair than the flight. LIAT, the Caribbean Airlines, more than connecting the region. Again, the major developments of this day, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister puts the ball in the opposition's court on acceding to the CCJ as the country's final court, telling them to bring the constitutional motion and he will support it. And in sport, Wendy's captain Jason Holder expects big things from young batting star Shimran Hetmeyer, who top scored in the first of three ODIs against Bangladesh. Now that's Caribbean Newsline. For news and sport around the clock, subscribe to CarnaNews.com. And for more of our programming, log on to CaribVision.tv and subscribe to CaribVision's YouTube channel. We'll be back here tomorrow. But from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching. Do have yourselves a good night.